Hey there, Mark Brown. You have no idea. Well, maybe you do how unbelievably pumped I am. We have been asking Judy for like a year. She is my hero. As you know, she changed the trajectory. She made being funny possible to a guy who couldn't even speak up uh, and is dyslexic and had no hope. So Mark Brown, what do you think of Judy Carter? Well, all I know is when I got to work with you, you were all so enthusiastic. You said, when I first got started, I had to learn one thing. And someone told me, Darren, if you're serious about comedy, you have to get the book. You have to get the book. And the first time you said the book, you said the book by Judy Carter. So now everybody, you got to meet the author of not only the book, but the comedy Bible. Let's meet Judy Carter. Anyone can give a presentation. Few deliver unforgettable presentations. What's the difference? You're about to find out. Welcome to the Unforgettable Presentations Podcast with your hosts, world champion speakers and coaches, Mark Brown. Mark Brown. Your life tells a story, and there's someone out there who needs to hear it. And Darren LaCroix. And Darren LaCroix. Stage time, stage time, stage time. Ready for some powerful presentation ahas? Let's dive right in. I'm, I'm like speechless. We get to talk to the legend of Judy Carter. Judy Carter, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Oh my God, so great to be here, you guys. You look great, Mark and Darren. Woo! Even with my gray eyebrows, I still look good with these gray eyebrows. <laughs> uh, Judy, there's so I, much uh, we want to cover, but we're just yeah. thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you. And I, I got to just start off, though. This is for me. This is my own little. Mm-hmm. I remember the day that you called me and said, Are you Darren LaCroix? Who the heck are you? Because I have been selling so many of your books, just part of my story. And you're like, what are you doing? Who are you? Oh, my God. No, I didn't say like, oh, who the hell are you? I didn't. You're, you're giving it a terrible reading, Darren. I taught you better than that. I didn't go like, yeah, who the hell are you, you plebeian? No, not at all. I remember I met you at NSA. Um, and, and I would, is that the guy who's been recommending my first book was, which was written, I think at the turn of the century, I think <laughs> of, you know, Ford has just invented an assembly line and they were discovering Alaska. <laughs> and, and I wrote this, I went, who is telling people to buy this old book and keeping it alive? Why am I still getting these royalty checks? And it's like Darren LaCroix, apparently this, this, this book you know, changed his life and, and um, he, and he's telling everybody by it. And so I, I came up to you and I remember you got on your knees. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, I went anyway, but you make me laugh there and we've been buddies since, and I've been doing, you know, guest appearing on some of your comedy weekends where I've met some wonderful of your people. So so, of course, here I am. Judy Carter, when, like, tell, if you won't mind sharing the story of when you went from magician to comedian, like, or where did your comedy ah. start? Well, here it is, people, if you're listening to this, you know, um, if you're really a confident person and totally together, chances are you're not that funny. So... <laughs> So <laughs> um, I found as a magician, cause I was a child and I, and I wanted to do magic because wow, it's such a great industry and profession for women, right? No discrimination. There are so many female, famous female magicians, right? What a good choice that was for me. But anyway, what I found was when um, I did this magic that when you forget something, like I was doing birthday parties for kids, and let's say you're doing sugar to goldfish, and then like I'm so forgetful, you you know you forget to put the water in with the goldfish, you produce dead goldfish, the kids are screaming, you know they're going to therapy for life, 
but they were laughing. And I, and I, and I realized that, you know, as a magician, when you, when you make mistakes, um, they're funny. And, and that's why all the books I've written on comedy are really about all the things that go wrong with your life. Um, uh, deserve focus because, <laughs> you know, they're funny with the right turn on them. And I became, a, I was a magician until one day my tricks didn't show up. It was a gig in Chicago, some mafia based place. And I go, I'm sorry, United Airlines, you know, made my tricks disappear and I can't go on. And, oh, yo, you think you're not going on? Well, listen, little lady, you get, you're going on because the man Hef, you know, Hugh Hefner is going to be here tonight. So you get your ass down to the buddy locker room and get your shit together because you are going up and there I am in the bunny locker room crying into the breasts of some playboy buddy and she says well just go out there and you know be yourself like what the hell does that mean anyway um and that's when I went out there and I found like not having the tricks I still got laughs I told them what I would have done for them if my tricks were here they were laughing and um I think my first joke I ever told was, by the way, you know, a lot of these Playboy bunnies are feminists. They're like, don't call us bunnies, we're rabbits. <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I remember I thought of it as I first walked on stage, it got a laugh and I went, oh my God, I don't, I, I don't have to schlep all these tricks. I can have carry on and have a career. Mm. So that's what happened to me. Wow. You know, what's funny for me to die real quickly, what I found very funny, very subtle, was the voice. Don't oh, hurry, honey, go on. Where that, where that, where that, that bunny voice come from with the soft, the soothing yeah. Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday. <laughs> Did they all talk like that, Judy? <laughs> no, certainly not. As well, we know Gloria Steinem was a bunny. But um, she did sing a song. I'll never forget. She sat me down and said, I will survive. As long as I know I can love, I know I'll stay alive. And I go, I mean, really? That's your advice. Okay. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's my, which is true of my whole life. You know, things go wrong, and that's the good news. Mm. <laughs> and where did you start teaching? Because you are one of the greatest teachers. You taught... Oh like Seth Rogen, uh, Saturday Night Live cast members, every comedian probably in LA has been through your comedy <laughs> workshops. Where did the teaching start? Yeah, it's so funny you mentioned Seth. I actually had a dream about him last night where I was at a party smoking pot with him. So that's weird that you mentioned him. <laughs> I really did. I, had a dream. I think it's just been, I've been quarantined. I'm just like dying to go to a party and pass a joint with someone. That would be good. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, when did um, I start teaching? Oh, well, you know, I was sometimes, on, I was writing that, uh, the gravy train days of uh, comedy clubs in the 80s and 90s. And I, I, sometimes I was on the road for 40, I think the most I've been on the road was 46 weeks. Wow. And uh, out of the year. And I, I see so many comics now and they go, oh, I stayed at your house while you were on the road. I said, some of them I didn't even know, but my house became a thing like, oh, yeah, stay at Judy's house. She's not there. I was living in a little uh, cottage uh, in Santa Monica. And I just, it just got so hard on the road. And I remember there was a gig at Governor's on Long Island. Um, I live in LA, I was born in LA, but I was in Long Island. And I'm not really used to, I mean, I know a lot of people think I sound like New York-y, but I'm like New York light, right? And I don't know, Mark, have you ever played, um, you know, Long Island? And as like, Long Island? Long, Long Island? Island? Yeah. So they're going like, yes, you effing suck. You effing suck. You're not funny. You think you're funny? And that's while I was walking up to the stage. <laughs> Wow, tough crowd. I, yeah, I hadn't even I haven't even done a joke yet. It's like, oh, geez, do I, you know, and 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 in the middle of that act, I quit. I walked off stage. I walked home. I, it was a bad day. During that day, my my dog had been attacked, hmm. and uh, I just went. I I can't I can't deal with this anymore. I need I need a life, and. I just went, you know, what am I going to do? So I started to teach 
a comedy. Nobody was teaching. I also wrote a book about it that 59 agents rejected. Um, but wow. I just wanted, you know, to do something different because I had done, I've traveled, you know, I op- I traveled with Prince, I traveled with Kenny Loggins, I, I had opened for so many people. Um, uh, and I just went, you know, I got to I wonder what it's like to have a normal life. And you know, go, go to work. So I rent an office. I went to work every day pretending I had a job. And then I started to write. And then I, there was a club in LA called Igby's, Jan Smith and um, ran it. Nicest guy in showbiz. And he said, oh, use my club, teach a class there. And next thing I know, the, my book's on Oprah. <laughs> has me on. Corporations and now want me to speak on humor. Like I'm a humor expert. My uh, classes, everybody wants to take the, this class because I developed a certain methodology that I've continued to use. It definitely works. And and it's so great. My students who have like Maz Jobrani, I mean, I always teach people um, to really be who you are and your most authentic self. And I, I think my, my former student, who's the best example of this, is Hannah Gatsby. I don't know if you guys, did you see her Netflix special? Oh my God. I mean, she was an art major and she's very brilliant. And she does jokes about Picasso. She won an gr- uh, Emmy for it. Um, genius, genius comedy. And, you know, and this is definitely the case where the student teaches the teacher because I could only aspire to that. That's what I'm aspiring to. Cause I think in life and in our art and in our speaking and whatever you do, uh, the secret sauce is your authenticity. Mm. And that's a long journey to find that, you know, when you stop trying to please people and start, stop trying to uh, make people like you and just tell the, Tell the T, as the millennials say, so tell the truth. And um, that that is where I continue to try and strive for myself. Mm. Now, I've got a question for you, Judy, because you go from magician to unintended humorist, and then you're becoming a speaker at corporations, wanting to speak, and you're teaching. That seems like several transitions in your career there. Was it difficult to transition from being funny to make people laugh on stage, but being humorous to teach, to educate, to inspire, to move Mm. a corporate audience? What was that change like for you? Well, that's a really, really good question. Uh, First of all, I learned very quickly that in a corporate gig, you cannot use the word nipples. Just don't do it. <laughs> There's a lot you just can't do. Um, I learned a lot. I, I was, um, I did a gig for Genentech um, last year when we all could do gigs. And um, and at the end, I told a, a, a powerful story. I had to do like four gigs. So I was running out of material. Mm. And I first came out, I'm trying to be funny, trying to be funny. And then the last one, I went, you know what? I'm just going to tell the story, not that funny. And the CEO took me outside and says, I want you to tell you that that was your best day. And I go, really? But I wasn't very funny. I didn't do a lot of material. She goes, you moved us. You truly moved us. And you don't have to try and be funny. You are funny. And you were so present with that story and so with us. And that's what we will remember. And I, I got to tell you, it's like just a CEO, a business person, knowing nothing about showbiz, who gave me the best showbiz advice ever. Um, and that is that we don't try to be funny. We, again, um, express our natural um, funniness without trying. It's just like trying to be funny is like uncomfortable for an audience. It's like going on a date with someone who's trying to get them, you know, get you to love them. It's, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> so when we are just naturally ourselves, you'll find that we are funny, you know, and of course there's places that you can carve and punch and head to a joke. But I think more important than jokes right now are, is that you are very real 
you know, that you're real with whatever you're doing. And Judy, I, I have to tell you a story that you may never have heard before that involves you indirectly. Uh, you know, I'm one of your biggest fans ever and will be. Um, however, when I was working on my championship speech, ouch, I went to work with Mark. I drove two and a half hours to work with him. You might have heard this story. I showed Wait, where, where did you live, Mark? In a house. I mean, sorry, I, I, lived, <laughs> I lived in Mount Vernon, New York. And he ah. was up in Auburn, Mass. Two and a half hours drive from him to me each way. So oh. a perspective for you and for our listeners as well. Yeah. So I showed Mark the first version of the speech. You've heard this story before. He said, oh, Dad, we have some work to do. And I was like, what? I didn't <laughs> told me to do. I wrote the greatest speech I could write from the level I was at. And so we actually almost, we almost went fisticuffs. Seriously. How stupid is that? I want to punch my coach. Like Mark Brown, the, the, one of the biggest arts in the world. And then he looked at the speech and he said, there's something missing. We need a failure. And I sat back and I'm like, I don't know. And then I remembered back to the book that you wrote and the jokes that I wrote from the book. And so I said, well, I used to do this little subway joke back when I was doing stand up." And he said, try it. <laughs> and so I just told the joke and he's like, that's perfect. And it came right from your teaching and it was right there in front of me. And so you helped me write my championship speech from you taking the time to write that book. So do I get a cut of everything you did so far <laughs> since that? No, yeah, yeah. You know, I will send it to you and you can get it for <laughs> one year. <laughs> you know, well, it's, well, here's, it's yeah, funny, Judy. Ahead, you say that because um, someone, or Darren was, was, was doing a, 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 a a live stream last week and somebody asked him so darren what do you win when you win the championship he says you win a trophy and that's it so there's no there's no royalties to give to you on that unfortunately but you know all kidding aside though i gotta go back to one thing you said darren and i have been approached for 20 years by speakers who want to become world champion speakers they want to rock the house and they say, look, my speech is good, but I got to add this humor. I got to add this humor. I got to add ah, this humor. Yes, 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 yes. And I can see you already beginning to respond. So I'll let you just follow through. What are you thinking, Judy, to that phrase, I got to add humor? Well, very often, because I have worked with Toastmaster people, and very often it's like rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic. <laughs> and, right. <laughs> Right, you know what I'm talking about. It's like this speech, this this speech that doesn't make any sense, has nothing real in it, is is just a lot of BS. Now we're going to punch it up with humor, and now it'll be perfect. And um, yeah, that's that. It's going down, baby. It's going down. <laughs> I um, you know, I just I, I I'm just remi remembering this story about. Um, teaching for Darren, we, we were doing it in Vegas, at the Queens Hotel or Four something. Queen. The Four Queen, Queen, what? Four Queens, Four Queens, right? Downtown Vegas, yep. And there was a woman, Lynette Charity, in, in the class. Um, and Lynette um, <laughs> was um, telling a story in which she kind of mentioned like, well, my father was angrier some abuse or whatever, suggested that. And she kind of th just threw it away because she was making a joke about something else. And then afterwards I gave her a note that was, oh, can you tell me more about what happened in your childhood? And then she got so angry, she stormed out of the class, okay? Just none of your business, how dare you? Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I came home back after that day of teaching. And Darren, you said, I don't know, Judy, can you kind of cool it with this kind of, you know, it's like, you know, because of course, they're your babies, you know, you care about their well-being. And, and she was distraught. And so in the morning, Lynette and I met and she and I were both crying. I would say, I'm really sorry if I was too hard on you. She said, no, I'm sorry that I was so defensive we went down that path together and she created a speech that ended up um, um, going to finals um, and ended up, uh, I think she came in third place. She placed, you know, and she had a time issue. She went over because she was getting so many laughs. 
And now I, Lynette and I have become very dear friends. And she now is making a lot of money as a keynote speaker. And she is now talking about preventing suicide for doctors and talking about her own suicide attempt. So she, now you would think, oh, well, this is, this is going to be a really sad speech. No, it's, it is very funny and full of levity. And, 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 and that just shows you she had that, first of all, number one, from the story, we could tell that, that it's not easy to tell the truth about your life. It's not easy. I want to be funny. I want to be entertaining. What will people think? Well, my parents think. I don't want to reveal this. It doesn't make me look good. We have a saying, bad for life, good for comedy. So there has to be a willingness and, and, and it's not going to be easy. It's scary. It's frightening. It's taking a chance. But the people who take a chance become winners. Number, number two um, about what happened was that she, um, gee, I had this all numbered in my head and now I've just lost it all. But, but what I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that she worked on her speech in terms of what her message was. And number three, the very last step is polish, the humor polish, the humor pass, because it can only work if your speech has a very truthful essence and makes sense and is well structured. That's where you are. Because a lot of people go, no, I just want you to read the speech and punch it up. No, no, I'm not. we got to start from the beginning here, you know. Good message, clear structure, good story, follow it. And then we uncover the humor. And Judy, I have to, you knew I was going to ask you this because it was one of the most unforgettable presentations. Mm -hmm. I've seen in my life. And when we think about that, we think about 10,000 people in a studio, a stadium, but you had given a present, you were given a presentation at a VA uh, clinic or a hospital or something. And I drove out there to California just to be in the audience and watch. Oh, you. that's right. And it was what you did for those guys and gals and the nurses. Oh my goodness. I'll never forget that. I, I had, it was such a, a moving experience for me that I had forgotten that you were there. And now I, there was a, oh, Judy was the, Judy, the nurse who organized it. Okay, got it all. Yep. Now I understand. Yep. So, so I'm very interested for you to tell me how you remember it. I'll start the story and you fill in, please. I remember, I think we met there, but I was driving in the car thinking of my speech and going over, you know, laughing your way out of stress. And this is a lighthearted keynote where I talk about stress in the workplace, uh, you know, staplers that don't work, that kind of stress and just woohoo, you know, so this is the theme. But I get there and I find out it's a spinal injury unit at the VA hospital in Long Beach where they wheel these people in in beds and these people are hooked up to ventilators and they've just been injured in the war in Afghanistan and just, right? Do you remember that? Uh, and, it, and I was like, I don't know how I would handle this. <laughs> oh my God, it was so depressing. People just, you know, sitting there and staring at the floor and, and those were the nurses, you know, <laughs> right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, so it shows you, I'm telling you a serious story, but you can always have laughs, right? Mm. So do you remember this where they had all these balloons and they kind of floated up to the air ducts and started popping, giving people PTSD, like pop, pop. You know, these are people who just have been injured by exploding bombs and they had these balloons. It was a nightmare. Mm. And then I'm thinking... Um, you know, my speech is not going to cut it. Woohoo, lighten up <laughs> so you can't walk anymore. Whatever. You know, it's like, oh, make a joke and everything's better. I was going like, I can't, I have nothing to, to um. Oh, and then um, a man walked over to me and said, Ms. Carter, um, that's my son over there, Nick. 
and um, he was injured by a bomb in Afghanistan. He's 21 years old. And they say he'll never walk, never move his hands again, never arms, total quadriplegic. They say unless he does his therapy, he's going to die. And he's refused to do therapy. So I hope you have an inspiring message, Judy. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And then they introduce me and I'm walking up and I'm going, I, I'm out of my league here. And then I remembered something, someone from my life who, um, you know, you think, boy, there's no way I can build a bridge here. How can I relate? How can I connect? And all of a sudden this story comes, comes to me because sometimes, and, and I'm sure everybody in the audience who's listening has had this experience, like you have absolutely nothing. And you, just out of the blue, something ha- can, c- comes to you and, and it's perfect. And what came to me was that um, something I've never talked about, deeply personal, that my sister, Marcia, had severe cerebral palsy and she was a quadriplegic. She could not control her body. And I just remembered her funeral. She died when she was 58. And, you know, here's a woman who can't speak, uh, can't uh, communicate with just facial expressions, incontinent, can't walk. And yet, why were 100 people at her funeral talking about the purpose that Marcia gave to them? And, and I went up to Nick and I said, Nick, you have purpose in your life, just like my sister had purpose. And I want to give you my book. And I had just written the book, The Message of You. And could you read this? Because uh, you might not feel like your life has meaning, but it does. And you need to find it. And then I think I told some joke and then I started <laughs> to make fun of people, I guess. I don't know what I did. I, I, then one guy was a burn victim who was dressed in a weird thing. I went, oh, look, Lady Gaga's with her. everybody laughed. It was some stupid joke. Broke the ice. Is, is that how you remember it? Yeah, and I, I remember something about he, he, he wanted to flip something. Oh, that, yeah. So, well, anyway, I went back to see him like six weeks later. And he was doing his therapy. And I said to him, uh, Nick, what happened? He says, well, you, Judy, you really made me believe that I have a, a message, a purpose in life. What is it, Nick? Never give up. Because there was a doctor in Afghanistan and he told me I'll never walk and I'll never move my hands again. And look at me, Judy. And then he brings us his hand, brings us, look at me. He moves his hands up with great effort. He goes, I can almost give that doctor the finger. <laughs> and then he said, uh, I am going to speak to the in people, the soldiers coming into this unit. And the title of my speech is Never Give Up. So here's a case where once you know your message, and your message is always based on pain. It's not based on a bumper sticker you just read or a self-help book you just read. It's based on you and your journey from mess to success. Now, we all obsessed with our successes and want everybody to know how successful we are but truly it's it you have to see where you came from probably forgot about it most people when that i work with have to we do a deep dive into their life to find what was that inciting incident or time in their life that propelled them Um, So in this case was very dramatic. I mean, he's lost his entire body, you know, Mm. but those are the people who have the most powerful messages. And I remember during that event too, you, you started teasing them and it's almost like most people are afraid to tease them about what's going on with them, but you realize they need to feel like one of they, they wanted to laugh at themselves, but everyone else gets too freaked out. So they don't dare tease them. And you were teasing them about their situation and they loved you. Because yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a norm. First, I think you have to, 
when we're, when we speak, we're always an outsider, you know, and it's like, ah, who are you, you know, louder than us with the mic telling us what to do, you know, are you smarter, know, know it all. So I always think at the beginning, you have to reveal something of yourself to show that, you know, um, you're coming from your heart and that's why you're there. You know, Judy, we aren't all humorists. We have a range of listeners from new speakers, emerging speakers, to pastors, to pros. And I'm hearing and visualizing this scene where you're bridging a very fine line. You're walking a fine line between being offensive and being genuinely warmly humorous. And I've seen humorists who are just that offensive. You know, we can't all be Don Rickles. But how do you and how do our listeners kind of find that space between going over the top and being offensive, but at the same time being genuinely humorous? What goes on in your head and your heart to find that place? Oh, I really, nothing goes on in my head, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> nothing up there, just totally empty. Nothing up there. Oh, well, sometimes <laughs> it helps me find my keys, but <laughs> it's pretty useless. Um, it's, and I do mean that. I think that um, your body and your being and the way and who you are knows when you're pushing it and you're trying to be something you're not. I'm gonna be a Don Rickles, but more lighthearted. No, it doesn't work that way. It, it really is who you are. And, you know, and Darren has a wonderful saying, stage time, stage time, stage time. Now, every time you get in front of people, you find that line. Sometimes you cross it too much and that's really good because then you, you find, you bring it back. Well, that was too little. I mean, I did a gig um, in, I think it was Canada. It was for like 2,500 people. It was something, the power of something, I don't know, um, uh, um, convention. And I had not never done it before. And I didn't know that I was doing stuff on mammograms and this. And the audience went friggin' crazy because I was totally out there. The next gig I did, I did in North Carolina where they walked out of the room and called me offensive. The next gig I had was from the people who saw me perform in Canada at this one place. And, and by this time I went like, oh my God, I better hold it all back. I better be careful. And it was for a bank. And I went, this is a bank and they're gonna be really conservative. So I better like not do the show I did bombed in North Carolina. And they, afterwards they told me they were really disappointed. They said, we wanted the talk that you did that we saw in Calgary because you were so out there. What happened? I went, well, I was trying to be more corporate. Mm. The, ish, the thing here is trying. If you're trying to be something other than you, you're playing a game called you lose. You lose. You just lose. So as Darren says, stage time, stage time, stage time, get it because you're going to, you're going to get in your body this sense of this feels good, this feels bad. Let me do more of what feels good. And when you keep doing what feels good and the audience um, responds and that's one of the reasons you feel good because the audience responds, it feels good in you, it feels getting a good reaction from them. Well, I'll keep more of that. I'll do more of that. And maybe you do something a little outrageous and the audience is still with you. Go, okay, I could push it more. I could push it more. So, you know, and we can't please everybody. I mean, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very difficult in these times of such great division, um, you know, in this country of, um, and, and the cancel culture and people being careful Um of what 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 they're saying, um, so I'm I'm redefining my career right now. I'm actually because Mark, you asked about redesigning your career. Um, I'm I'm now um, getting away from keynoting, getting away from everything. Um, I've just written a solo show about my life that, um, and, and I'm, I'm really happy to say this because it was maybe five, six years ago 
what Darren's thing where I told a story about myself and Darren said, you should do this as a one person play. I finally wrote it. It's been optioned. Um, I'm talking to New York producers about it. It's very exciting. And, and, and um, it that was like six years ago, Darren, I think it was at wow. least. Yeah. And it took me, I started to seriously write it two years ago. It sucked, it sucked, it sucked. And then it's, got a little better. I did, I, I did some Zoom readings. Um, I got some help and um, I got it to the place where um, I have a lot of interest in it once the um, quarantine is over. Um, and then I also got interest on the book version of it from, from a, a publisher. So, you know, the thing that I did um, in Darren, while well, teaching Darren's and just shared a story and people said, wow, that should be a, took me, what, six years? So be patient with yourself, people. Creativity is a little frail thing and you just got to tend to it, nurture it, walk away from it, let it sit, come back to it, you know, takes time. Yeah, everyone wants that. Here, just here, make it funny and then and it doesn't work that way. And, and yeah. sometimes it does. I mean, I mean, sometimes I wrote a TED talk for Dahlia Mogahed, who was the most unfunny person you can meet. She was a Muslim analyst for the Obama administration, dealt in charts and graphs, brilliant woman, no sense of humor. And, but she was brilliant. So, so we had that to work with. And I ended up getting her so friggin' funny. She did a TED Talk, got over 7 million hits, was voted one of the best TED Talks of uh, 2017, and got her on the Trevor Noah show, where she was hilarious. So um, you can. I mean, you know, she also really worked at it because comedy delivery is, um, you, you screw up one little word here or there, or emphasize something a little different, you know, it's not going to work, but boy, did she, she do a great job and was willing to take that risk for a serious person. I thought she was. <laughs> she, said, she said like, Oh, I'm worried about, um, I told my comedy coach, Judy, that I was worried about bombing. And she said, well, this isn't the first time they've seen a Muslim bomb. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. But you see what she did? She attributed the joke to me because it was an edgy joke. Mm -hmm. She was Muslim, so she could say that. But she attributed it to me to take the onus on her. So it was like brilliant the way we, we did it. Mm -hmm. And working with her became an NPR piece on All Things Considered about a Jew and a Muslim you know, Jew working to make a Muslim funnier. And then I went on to work with Muslim thought leaders in Washington, D.C., who talked to the press to, to teach them how to talk with more humor. Mm. And Judy, you just reminded me of something, you know, my stage time, stage time, stage time line and talking about being authentic. That was a pain point for me. I, ah. I even thought of that. But it was so hard to go up there because I was so unfunny that that was part of my pain and struggle. It was a habit handed to me from Dave Fitzgerald and Vinny Favorito, but I followed through, but that was such unbelievably painful, especially at the beginning. So you just made me realize that's why- Interesting. With There's nothing more funny to me than a guy who's really serious actually admitting that he's not funny. It's very vulnerable to me, I think. I mean, we talk about vulnerability. People think, oh, I got to tell like these horrible stories from life. No, it's just like a simple honesty like that is always when people go, oh, I'm like not funny. I clear a room. I try and tell a joke. It's like, boom, what? Three, two, one, gone. And I find that so funny. That was that was one of my other jokes in my championship speech. I said the first time my brother ever laughed at me was when I told him I wanted to be a comedian. Oh. And Judy, we got to brag on you because I'm so pumped for you. Your new comedy Bible as of today is like number one new release. The new comedy Bible on Audible by Judy Carter. Judy, congratulations. Yes, that 
was today. I've been so upset about all the news and the politics and everything. And then I went, ah, oh, my, oh, my book, not only on Audible is released, but it's number one in new releases in comedy. Oh my God. Right. Woohoo. And if somebody was interested in learning more from you or what, what does that book do for them? Like if I'm going to read the comedy Bible, I'm a presenter. Uh, our audience is presenters from pastor to corporate to professional. <laughs> what are some of the secrets inside? Okay. Well, it's the new comedy Bible. The old comedy Bible was written quite a long time ago, and this was just written, released this year. So this is the New Testament. Consider it that. <laughs> Uh, the New Testament of comedy. So it has 48 exercises. And this, I'm very pragmatic about this. This is how you create 60 minutes of comedy material. This is like your Netflix special. You need 60 minutes. And of course, you need a lot more because most of it won't work and you have to cut it down. So, but this gives you 40, 48 exercises that you simply do and you get um material that works because comedy at its core is formulaic. There's a list of three, there's the half and half, you know, there's the comparison jokes, the dialogue jokes. And when you get a comedy idea, a lot of people will tell a story that does not work. You know, there I was, da, 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 you know, so there's some really basic rules to learn um, about how to set up a joke, deliver it and do an act out, then do a mix. If you don't know what the terms I'm using are, you need to get this book because it'll it'll take when you get a funny idea, it'll show you how you could write it. So it is it has a pow at the end. It has a setup that leads someone in one direction and then turns it. So it's 48 exercises. And matter of fact, it also has if you think you're not funny, a funny test. Take it. See, see how you do on it. Um, and also, if people want to email me free at judycarter.com, I'm going to I have an online comedy module that has uh, self guided video lessons and usually costs seven hundred and seventy dollars to join this during the uh, pandemic and the quarantine. I'm giving it to people totally free. And so they can sign up free at judycarter.com and sign up and and there's actually no like oh i'm gonna I'm gonna take your email and do an upsell no no upsell i'm too busy for that 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 junk so just you know uh email free at judycarter.com and matter of fact every now and then we have these free um zoom comedy jam sessions that are super fun um so I won't say I'm having one this Friday, although I am because I don't know when this podcast is released, but um, you sign up. I'll tell you when I'm doing them. Awesome. Judy Carter, thank you so much for being here. You, yeah. I am just forever grateful for you taking the time to teach and you've made so many presenters and brought so much humor to the presentation world through so many people. It's ridiculous. And Mark Brown, what do we have for keepers today from Judy Carter's episode? What I might call is my top 10, but I'll list 10 things. One, things go wrong. And that's the good news. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> Be your most authentic self, no matter what happens. Number three, the secret sauce is your authenticity. Number four, please, for me, talk to me first. Don't try to be funny. Just be real. Wow. Don't try to be funny. Just be real. It's not easy to tell the truth about your life, but that's where the message comes from. It says, apply the humor polish. Don't add humor. Apply humor polish. Don't add humor. With every audience you get, and some may surprise you, here's a good one for you. Always ask, how can I connect? Always ask, how can I connect? A gem for me is this one. Your message is based on your journey from mess to success. Your message is based on your journey from mess to success. If you're trying to be anything other than yourself, you're playing a game called You Lose. You're playing a game called You Lose. And for me, my absolute favorite is this one. Be patient with yourself. Creativity is a frill thing. It takes time, but you'll get it. I love that. Thank you so much, Judy Carter. Darren? Thank you, guys.
Judy Carter, what, if a presenter wanted to be funnier and you were having coffee with them, what's that one bit of advice that you would tell them over coffee? Read my book. <laughs> That's it. All right. <laughs> Perfect. Well said. Uh, we'll jo join us next week. We're not even sure what we're going to talk about next week, but Judy Carter, thank you for being amazing and that huge heart that you have. You truly are unforgettable. Ah. Thank you, Judy. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. So see you all next week, guys. Be Bye -bye. unforgettable. Hey there, this is Darren. I hope you enjoyed that program and you got some great insights from watching this video podcast. Now, we don't put all of them on YouTube like you're watching now. We just put a select few. So if you want to get all the episodes, you can go right now to Apple Podcast. You can go to Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify, or check it out on your favorite platform. See if it's there for you. But we'd love to have you subscribe. Join us every single week for new content, new stories, and new strategies behind unforgettable presentations. Subscribe now. Check out StageTimeUniversity.com, where good presenters become unforgettable.